So what I hope to do in the next half hour is uh, walk you through a very brief overview of the history of the church's encounter with other religions, and again, follow that up with a brief overview of the response of the church to the encounter with these various religions. So if we were to go back to the early church, even beginning with St. Paul, and looking at the writings of the early church fathers, we would sense that there is this ongoing tension, uh, first between what we call orthodoxy and orthopraxy. So correct belief or correct doctrine, orthodoxy, and correct practice, orthopraxy. So within the scriptures, we're about to see that when it comes to salvation, eternal life with God, we see both. We see scriptures that support orthodoxy, and we're going to see that there are scriptures that support orthopraxy. And it's not until we get to the Second Vatican Council that we see a real good balance of the use of the two in scripture and tradition when it comes to the church's encounter with members of other religions. So we're going to look at orthopraxy and orthodoxy. And we're going to see how dialogue in the church has developed. Now, sometimes people get nervous and they think it's changed. And so I hope to clarify that for you, especially those who are very knowledgeable uh, when it comes to the documents of the Second Vatican Council, the 21st Ecumenical Council that is met to date between 1962 and 65. Sixteen documents came out of that council. As, lo as well as a more developed understanding of the church's relation with members of other religions. But that didn't just drop into the picture in the 1960s. So we're going to see how that understanding developed over centuries. And that understanding developed in response to a deepened knowledge of both what it means to be saved, so the word salvation, on the one hand, and what it means to be church on the other. So salvation and church. So we're going to see how when it comes to salvation, if we were to go back and reread some of those early decrees of the early councils or gatherings of bishops of the church, right through to the Middle Ages, bishops tend to speak of salvation of souls. When we get to the Second Vatican Council, especially with the influence of our current Pope, as the theologian Joseph Ratzinger, who was present at that council as an advisor, and the influence of uh, the great blessed John Paul II, who was present as well as a bishop at that council, both encouraged the church to deepen its understanding of salvation and start to speak of the salvation of the whole person. And so, some theologians have defined salvation as the restoration of God's image in us. And of course, we experience the fullness of that restoration in eternal life with God beyond the grave. But it is a process that begins here and now. Now, when we go back to the early church and we look at the encounter of those first early Christians with pagans, with Jews, with members of various tribes, especially in North Africa, the concern, of course, is the salvation of their souls. So dialogue with members of other faiths goes right back to the book of Acts, where the early Christians believe, and we continue to believe today, as Catholic Christians, that Jesus is the eternal source of salvation for all people, whether they know him or not. So that continues to be the official position of the Catholic Church, that Jesus is the source of eternal salvation for all people. And because he is the source of eternal salvation in those early centuries, the concern was to baptize people into the true church and help facilitate this renewed faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Son of God. So in the early church, church membership was high on the list in terms of criteria that needed to be satisfied in order for one to be saved. So we have church membership, baptism brought one into the church, 
and then your faith in Jesus Christ and your love of neighbor kept you in the good books. And so at the time, if we were to read some of the early Christian writers, by the time we get to the 5th century, you get the sense that they believed that the world was coextensive with Christianity. There was no knowledge of the New World at this point, of other neighboring nations in Asia. And so the belief was that the gospel had been preached everywhere. So if the gospel had been preached everywhere, and someone failed to embrace the good news and be baptized, they were guilty of a willful rejection of the gospel. So it's during this time, around the 2nd to the 5th century, you begin to hear the axiom, no salvation outside the church. Okay, so it's no salvation outside the true church, because we know at this point there are various forms of Christianity emerging. So there are those bishops who believe they are part of the true church of Jesus Christ, and then there are those who claim to belong to another true church of Jesus Christ. So you have someone like St. Augustine, an early bishop from North Africa, saying things like, well, yeah, that bishop over there, whom we considered a heretic, oh, yeah, it's fine that he's baptized and he can continue to baptize people. He can even sing hallelujah. But because he's not a member of the true church, he won't be saved. <laughs> so even though you had a valid baptism, it had to be legally celebrated in the true church in order for one to be saved. So dialogue with people outside of Christianity in the early centuries was very much focused on evangelization and conversion. Because of this belief that you could not go to heaven unless you were a baptized member of the true church. Now, that teaching continues right up through to the discovery of the New World in 1492. The discovery of the New World in 1492 now introduces a whole new variety of challenges. Now, the church recognizes that there are all kinds of people living in far off places who have never heard of Jesus Christ or his gospel and have never had the opportunity to be baptized. Surely they would not be guilty of a willful rejection of Jesus Christ. So how could you hold someone accountable if no one had ever brought the gospel to them? So even before that time, Thomas Aquinas is writing in Italy in the 13th century. And if you know his teaching or if you've read his Summa, you're, you can appreciate that one, he himself was in dialogue with Jews and with Muslims and with pagans in his search for a deeper meaning to life and to what it means to live in Christ and to embrace Christ. So here was someone who was already in dialogue with members of other traditions. But he's also concerned that there could be people in these neighboring tribes in Africa, for example, who had never heard of Jesus or the Gospel. And so he, he talks about this child in the wilderness, that even if there was a child in the wilderness, he refers us to the letter to the Hebrews, where the anonymous writer of the letter to the Hebrews writes, God honors those who seek him. So Thomas Aquinas believed in his heart that if someone using the natural law or their ability to reason desired to know the divine and to know God, God would honor that desire and that request and would send a messenger. So Thomas Aquinas was very hopeful, so hopeful that when it came to baptism, he was one of the first to acknowledge what we call in our tradition, baptism of desire. So I'm sure you've heard of different kinds of baptism in our church. Baptism by water and the Holy Spirit, our official baptism. Some speak of baptism by fire with the Holy Spirit, the day that they feel they responded to God's call and they've turned their heart over to God. And there was also a baptism by blood, that the, the baptism of the early martyrs. Uh, many of them may have died even before they were baptized. And those in the early church believed that God would honor their sacrifice and give them eternal life. 
even though they may not have been baptized. But then we had something else that the early church writers were struggling with, and it's baptism of desire. Now, by the time we get to the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, he made the distinction between an explicit desire for baptism, and an example of that would be of a catechumen or a candidate for baptism who is preparing to be received in this church, today the RCIA program, and unfortunately this person dies before he or she is baptized. And Aquinas believed God would honor that person's desire to be baptized. So that is an example of an explicit desire for baptism. But then on the other hand, mindful of that child in the wilderness, that God would not abandon those who seek him with a sincere heart. He believed in an implicit desire for baptism. That you could have the case of someone in the wilderness who has never had an encounter with a missionary with the Bible, with Jesus, with the Gospel, and his hope and prayer was that that person's desire to know God implied a belief in Jesus Christ, whether he knew it or not. That if he desired God and the truth, whether he knew it or not, he desired Jesus. Now, by the time we get to the discovery of the new world, we can detect in the writing of certain Jesuits and Dominicans a few things. One, their struggle in the New World with mass conversions and baptisms. How in some cases, some were conser concerned that some were preaching the gospel in an unconvincing way and were forcing baptisms. And so some of these Jesuits and Dominicans felt Surely God should have mercy on these people that if we are going to bring the gospel and Jesus Christ to these people We should at least act like him When we bring the gospel we should witness to Christ and bring him a for bring them a foretaste of who Christ is So here is this concern around how do we evangelize? And are we bringing them the sweetness of Jesus Christ or are we forcing them to convert? All of that went on to inform a key document in the Council of Trent. So again, I mentioned that to, from, the, from the year 325 right through to 1965, the churches had 21 ecumenical or universal gatherings of bishops. The Council of Trent was a key gathering in response to one, of course, the Protestant Reformation, and two, the need to reform a few things. So, uh, wonderful things came out of this council. One is the extraordinary form of the Mass. Before that, there were various forms of the Mass, and it's Trent that gives us the one form of the Mass. But in its one document on justification, meaning reconciliation with God, and what we need to do to be made right before God, this was a big debate within and among the reformers. Is it works or faith? And again, relying on the teaching of St. Paul, we are justified or made right before God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so here the church is responding to the views of the reformers, and in that response, reminds uh, they remind us that baptism justifies us. So baptism makes us right before God and restores all righteousness. And so they affirm the need to be baptized in order to receive eternal salvation. But inspired by Thomas Aquinas, this is a key development in the church's teaching. The bishops went on to say either baptism or the desire for it. So that is one key step to the church acknowledging that there may be people who may not be baptized in reality, as St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas put it, but in spirit are baptized. They desire to know God. So the discovery of the new world then leads to this developed understanding of how does the church relate to these members of other religious traditions? How do we engage them? How do, they, how do we woo them over to Jesus Christ? Now, moving into 
the 19th and 20th century, the teaching remained the same. So even though we acknowledged baptism of, the de of desire, the ideal was conversion. The ideal was baptism and exposing people to the fullness of the faith and of the gospel. Now, by the time we get to the 19th century and the teaching of Pope Pius IX, the church is very much aware that only one-third of the world's population is Christian. And those statistics are still the same for today. So one-third of the world's population is Christian. And of that third, one-half is Catholic. And with that understanding, you have popes like Pius IX and those advising him trying to reevaluate their approach not only to members of other religions, but also members of other Christian traditions. And with that, and the inspiration of Baptism of Desire and the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, two popes, Pope Pius IX in the 19th century and Pope Pius XII in the 20th century, both make the distinction between inculpable ignorance and culpable ignorance. So those whose rejection or so-called rejection of Jesus is without guilt. <laughs> so someone who was raised somewhere in Asia or in Africa or South America who may never have heard the gospel or Jesus Christ, they are not guilty of a willful rejection. And then culpable ignorance of those who know Jesus as the Savior and the Messiah and they reject him anyway. So that distinction is made so much so that there was an interesting controversy that broke out in Boston just before 1947. Uh, there was a Jesuit priest by the name of Father Feeney. Now, Father Feeney was troubled by the teaching of Pius XII. And he continued to affirm the axiom, no salvation outside the church. That unless you are a baptized member of the Catholic Church in a state of grace, you could not be saved. And it created such a stir that they, there were priests who were now opposed to one another on both sides of the debate. And they called in Archbishop Cushing at the time to settle the debate. Well, what is the official teaching of the church on those outside of the faith and salvation? Archbishop Cushing, uh, Cushing then wrote to Rome, and at the time the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was uh, called the Holy Office, formerly called the Holy Office of the Inquisition. <laughs> so the Holy Office issued a statement affirming this teaching of inculpable ignorance, that we leave it to the mercy of God, that only God could judge whether there was really a willful rejection of the gospel. With that, two other occasions, there were two other groups of clergy who were convinced that there was no grace offered outside of the Catholic Church. And so grace is a free spiritual gift that God gives us, a gift of strengthening, a gift of the Spirit. On two occasions, two separate bishops condemned the views of those two groups of priests and said absolutely God's grace is available outside of the Catholic Church. So those are a few developments leading up to the Second Vatican Council. So I'm just going to spend the last 10 minutes or so on the Second Vatican Council and where we are now with dialogue. The Second Vatican Council then did not introduce anything new. And that's why sometimes it gets tricky if you search the internet. And you'll find all kinds of articles online that are a little questionable that condemn the Second Vatican Council's teaching on its teaching on the church's relationship with other religions, thinking that this was something new. It is not something new. There are two documents in particular that affirm the teaching of Trent and the teaching of Pius IX and Pius XII. So on the one hand, we have the teaching that elements of truth and grace can be found outside of the Catholic Church and in particular here, in other Christian communities. So they are joined to us in baptism. So as of Vatican II, the baptism of other Christians, as long as it's, um, it's administered in the right way, 
is considered valid and legal. And so they are joined to us through baptism. So the church maintains that the fullness of salvation is still in the Catholic Church, but they are joined to us and there are elements of truth and grace in their own traditions. When it came to members of other religions, a key document is Nostra Aetate, the Declaration on the Church's Relationship with Other Religions. And this is what the Church uh, had to say about members of other faiths. The Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. She has a high manner, high regard for the manner of life and conduct, the precepts and doctrines which, although differing in many ways from her own teaching, nevertheless reflect a ray of light of that truth which enlightens all people. Though that particular text refers to um, the non-monotheistic religions, it goes on to be even more affirming of both Judaism and uh, Islam. So I'd encourage you to look to Nostra Tate. Another key text is the dogmatic constitution on the church in the modern world. Chapter 16, or paragraph 16 rather, is the paragraph that again addresses this eternal life with God beyond the grave. And the bishops here affirm that all people can attain eternal salvation if they do God's will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience. And we leave it to God to decide whether there was a willful rejection of Jesus Christ. So only God knows what that person knew of him. And the, the church makes the case, if they knew who he was, they would not reject him. So even if there is a perceived rejection, the church then that says, in line with the teaching of Thomas Aquinas, is this person doing God's will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience? So with that, we have the pontificate of Paul VI that really moves into religious dialogue to the forefront. So in 1964, on Pentecost Sunday, Pope Paul VI instituted a special department of the Roman Curia for relations with people of other religious traditions. At first, it was called the Secretariat for Non-Christians. In 1988, John Paul II renamed it the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Now it has three goals. The first goal is to promote mutual understanding, respect, and collaboration between Catholic Christians and followers of other religions. The second goal, to encourage the study of religions, where now most faculties of theology and seminaries now offer courses on interreligious dialogue and or the study of world religions. Our Catholic school board system in the province offers courses on the study of world religions. And finally, to promote the formation of persons dedicated to dialogue. So dialogue here is a two-way communication involving speaking, listening, giving, receiving, mutual growth and enrichment. However, one is not expected to compromise one's faith in Jesus Christ. So while the goal is not conversion, so dialogue is not to be used as a method of conversion. Evangelization, yes, in certain contexts, but when it comes to official dialogues, um, the goal rather is to promote mutual understanding. So I am not expected to compromise my faith, nor am I expected to water down any of our doctrines. So I can present myself as a faithful Catholic Christian who loves her Lord, but is open to being in dialogue with a member of another tradition. So since 1964, dialogue commissions have been set up around the world at regional, national, and international levels. And so here in Canada, I am uh, one of the delegates for the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops on the official dialogue with Muslims. And so I am now the present Christian co-chair for the national dialogue with Muslims. And so when it comes to official dialogue at the national level, the various conferences of bishops have appointed a number of theologians who have expertise in this area to represent them in dialogue. So we cannot speak 
on behalf of the bishops without their approval um, and we have to be sure that we are representing the church universal. I'm not speaking as Josie Lombardi, as a private theologian. I speak for the church when I am in dialogue with the Muslims who are part of this committee. Um, Dr. Eileen Schuler is another example. Some of you may be familiar with her work. She's an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls and teaches at McMaster University. She is on the national dialogue with Jews. So here in Canada, we have the Christian consultation um, with Jews and Christians, the CCJC. And Dr. Eileen Schuler is uh, the delegate who has been chosen to speak on behalf of the bishops in that particular dialogue. So dialogue at the national level is more official. There's also dialogue at a universal level. Dr. Margaret O'Gara uh, from the University of St. Michael's College has worked on that type of dialogue at the universal level. And then, of course, there are dialogues set up at the regional level, so some more formal and some less formal. And so, in conclusion, the, the dialogue in which we engage has four forms. The first is the dialogue of life. So when we gather with Muslims in dialogue, we have chosen to support one of these four dialogues. And so those who have more experience on the front lines some of them would rather work in this dialogue of life. Um, one particular project we now have is promoting um, preparation for mixed marriages. So the Office for Ecumenism in Quebec has prepared a manual for clergy and for lay people who are preparing Christians who may be marrying uh, members of the Muslim faith. So it gives them a brief overview of Islam, and it helps them look at the potential challenges of an interfaith marriage. Looks at Sharia law and what a mixed marriage may look like here in Canada and what a mixed marriage may look like in Saudi Arabia. And so it's a very honest um, overview of the potential challenges in mixed marriage. So that's an example of dialogue of life. The second form is dialogue of actions. This usually consists of social justice or awareness programs. So we have had Muslims and Christians, for example, work together on housing projects. Um, the need to promote access to clean drinking water in a variety of communities around the world. So some have dedicated themselves to that type of dialogue. Others who have more of a theological expertise have worked on the third form of dialogue called the dialogue of theological exchange. So in this case, the bishops for example, may call upon a theologian to write a draft document for them that then would later be published by the Ontario bishops or the Canadian Conference of Bishops. So I've helped work on a number of um, little mini videos and uh, brochures that the bishops will now publish on the topic of Islam and the church's relationship with Islam. And sometimes we participate in panel discussions as well. And finally, the dialogue of religious experience. So here, uh, we may come together and share our experience of faith and prayer. So while on the one hand, we do promote evangelization, we want people to know Jesus Christ, and in particular the new evangelization where we're focusing now on the conversion of the baptized, where we have gone outside of the church, and now we're trying to come back to the church and try to breathe fresh air into our churches and bring people back to the gospel. And on the other hand, we still would like other people to know our Lord, but on the other hand, we acknowledge that God honors those who seek Him.